Hello dear learners, I am Dr. Shalini Prasad and I welcome you to the discussion of chapter 7 of psychology textbook of class 12, social influence and group processes. Today you will be learning about nature and formation of groups, stages of group formation and types of groups. Nature and formation of groups. Think about your day to day life and various social interactions you have. In the morning, before going to school, you interact with your family members. In school, you discuss topics and issues with your teachers and classmates. And after school, you phone up, visit or play with your friends. In each of these instances, you are part of a group which not only provides you the needed support and comfort, but also facilitates your growth and development as an individual. Have you ever been away to a place where you were without your family, school and friends? How did you feel? Did you feel there was something vital missing in your life? Here in this chapter, we will start understanding the importance of groups. Now, group, organized system of two or more people who interact and are interdependent have common motives, have a set of role relationships among members and have norms that regulate the behavior of its members. Now it has salient features, a social unit consisting of two or more individuals who perceive themselves as belonging to the group. This characteristic of the group helps in distinguishing one group from another and gives the group its unique identity. A collection of individuals who have common motives and goals, common functions uh, either working towards the given goal or away from criteria that meets facing the group. A collection of individuals who are interdependent, what one is doing may have consequences for the others. Suppose one of the fielders in the cricket team drops an important catch during the match. This will have consequences for the entire team. Individuals who are trying to satisfy a need through their joint association also influence each other. A gathering of individuals who interact with one another either directly or indirectly. A collection of individuals whose interactions are structured by the set of roles and norms. This means that the group members perform the same function every time the group meets and the group members adhere to the group norms. Norms tells us how we ought to behave in the group and specify the behaviors expected from the group members. Groups can be differentiated from the collection of people. For example, a crowd is also a collection of people who may be present at a place or a situation by chance. Suppose you are going on the road and an accident takes place. Soon, a large number of people tend to collect. This is an example of a crowd. There is neither any structure, no feeling of belongingness in the crowd. Behavior of the people in crowd is irrational and there is no interdependence among members. Teams are special kinds of groups. Members of teams often have complementary skills and are committed to a common goal or purpose. Members are mutually accountable for their activities. In teams, there is a positive synergy attained through the coordinated efforts of its members. The main difference between the groups and teams are, in groups, the performance is dependent on the contributions of individual members. In teams, both individual contributions and the team work matter. In groups, the leaders or whosoever is heading the group holds responsibility for the work. However, in teams, although there is a leader, members hold themselves responsible. An audience is also a collection of people who have assembled for a special purpose, maybe to watch a cricket match or a movie. Audiences are generally passive, but sometimes they go into a frenzy and become mobs. In mobs, there is a definite sense of purpose. There is a polarization in attention and actions of people are in common directions. Mob behavior is characterized by homogeneity of thought and behavior as well as impulsivity. 
In general, people join groups for various reasons. There are following reasons for it. First, security. Now, when we are alone, we feel insecure. People reduce their insecurity by joining the group. Being with people always gives us a sense of comfort and protection. As a result, people feel stronger and less vulnerable to threats. Second, status. When we are members of group, they are perceived to be important for others. We feel recognized and experience sense of power. Suppose your school wins an inter-institutional debate competition, you feel proud and think that you are better than others. Self-esteem. Group provides feelings of self-worth and establish a positive self-identity. Being a member of a prestigious group enhances one's self-concept. Fourth, satisfactions of one's psychological and social needs. Groups satisfies one's social and psychological needs such as the sense of belongingness, giving and receiving attention, love and power through a group. Goal Achievement Groups helps in achieving such goals which cannot be attained individually. There is a power in majority. People uh, also get recognition by joining the groups because it provides knowledge and information. Group membership provides knowledge and information and thus broadens our view. As individuals, we may not have all the required information. Groups supplement this information and knowledge. Group formation. In this section, we will see how groups are formed. Basic to the group formation, in some contact and some form of interaction between people, this interaction is facilitated by following conditions. Number one, proximity. Just think about your group of friends. Would you have been friends if you were not living in the same colony or going to the same school or maybe playing in the same playground? Probably your answer would say no. Repeated interactions with the same set of individuals gives us a chance to know them and their interests and attitudes. Common interests, attitudes and backgrounds are important determinants of your liking of the group members. Second, similarity. Being exposed to someone over a period of time makes us assess our similarities and paves the way for formation of groups. Why do we like people who are similar? Psychologists have given several explanations for this. One explanation is that people prefer consistency and like relationships that are consistent. So when two people are similar, there is consistency and they start liking each other. For example, you like playing football and another person in your class also loves playing football. There is a matching of your interests. There are higher chances that you may become friends. Another explanation given by psychologists is that when we meet similar people, they reinforce and validate our opinions and values. We feel we are right and thus we start liking them. Suppose you are the of the opinion that too much watching of the television is not good because it shows too much of violence. You meet someone who has a similar views this validates your opinion and you start liking the person who was instrumental in validating your opinion. Next, that is common motives and goals. When people have common motives and goals, they give or they get together and form a group which may facilitate the goal attainment. Suppose you want to teach children in a slum area who are unable to go to the school. You cannot do this alone because you have your own studies and homework. You therefore form a group of like-minded friends and start teaching these children. So you have been able to achieve what you could not have done alone. Now let's talk about the stages of group formation which is given by Tuckman. Now when group members first meet there is a great deal of uncertainty about the members who will be there in the group what will be the goals and how it is to be achieved. People try to know each other and assess whether they will fit in. 
there is an excitement as well as apprehension. This stage is called as the forming stage. Often, after this stage, there is a stage of intra-group conflict, which is referred to as storming stage. In this stage, there is a conflict among members about how the target of the group is to be achieved, who is to control the group and its resources, and who is to perform what task. Now, when this stage is complete, some sort of hierarchy of leadership in the group develops and the clear vision as to how to achieve the group goal is there. Next to it is a storming stage is followed by another stage known as a norming stage. Group members by this time develop norms related to the group behavior. This leads to the development of a positive group identity. The fourth stage is a performing stage. By this time, the structure of the group has evolved and is accepted by the group members. The group moves towards achieving the group goals. For some groups, this may be the last stage of the group development. However, for some groups, for example, in the case of organizing committee, for a school function, there may be another stage known as the adjoining stage. In this stage, once the function is over, the group may be disbanded. Groups do not always proceed in a systematic manner. Stages could even take place simultaneously. Groups can also go back and forth between stages or skip a few stages. Group structure. During the process of group formation, the groups also develop a structure. We should remember that group structure develops as the members interact. Over time, this interaction shows regularities in distribution of tasks to be performed, responsibilities assigned to the members and the prestige or the relative status of the members. Let us talk about the elements of the group. Four important elements of the groups are number one, roles. Roles are socially defined expectations that individuals in a given situation are expected to fulfill. Roles refer to a typical behavior that depicts a person in a given social context. You have a role of a son or a daughter or with this role, there is a certain role expectation. Now, including the behavior expected of someone in a particular role. As a daughter or as a son, you are expected to respect the elders, listen to them and be responsible towards your studies. Norms. Norms are expected standards of behaviors and beliefs that is established or agreed upon or enforced by the group members. Now, they may be considered as a group's unspoken rules. In your family, there are norms that guides the behavior of the family members. In your family, there are norms that guides the behavior of family members. These norms represent shared ways of viewing the world. Status. Status refers to the relative social position given to the group members by others. This relative position or status may be either ascribed, given, uh, may be because of one's seniority or achieved, that is the persons has achieved status because of the expertise or the hard work. By being members of the group, by enjoying the status associated with the groups, all of us therefore strives to be the members of such groups which has a higher status as compared to the other ones. Even within the group, different members have different prestige and status. For example, the captain of the cricket team has a higher status compared to the members, although all are equally important for the team's success. Cohesiveness, it refers to the togetherness, binding or the mutual attraction among the group members. As a group becomes more cohesive, group members start to think, feel and act as a social unit and less like isolated individuals. Members of highly cohesive group have a greater desire to remain in the group in comparison to those who belong to the low cohesive group. Cohesiveness refers to the team spirit or we feeling or the sense of belongingness to the group. It is difficult to leave a cohesive group or to gain membership of the group which is highly cohesive. Extreme cohesiveness, however, may sometimes 
not be in the group's interest. Psychologists have identified this phenomena of group think which is a consequence of extreme cohesiveness. Now, let us talk about the types of groups. First is the primary group. Now, primary groups are the pre-existing formations that are usually given to the person. People usually remain a part of it through their lifetime. Includes face to face interaction and close physical proximity. Members share warm emotional bonds. Central to the person's functioning, major role, developing values and ideals. Boundaries are less permeable, cannot choose membership, join or leave easily. Examples are family, religion and caste. Next is your secondary groups. Groups which individuals join by choice. Relationships among members are more impersonal, indirect and less frequent. There may be may or may not be a short lived groups. It is easy to leave and join another group. Example, the political parties. Another type of group is the formal group. Now, functions based to be performed are explicitly stated in these groups. Formation based on specific rules or laws and members have defined roles. Set of norms helps these establishing an order in these groups. Examples could be universities or the office. Informal groups, roles of each member not so definite and specified. There is a close relationship among members who are existing in that. Formation is not based on rules and laws. For example, your peer group. Next is in-group. Now, in-group refers to one's own groups and it says we, especially when we talk about our country, we Indians. Members in this group, they are always viewed in a very similar manner and they are always seeing their members as favorable to each other. Whereas, in the out group, it is always they, for example, when we name other country other than our own country. Members of out group are always viewed differently, negatively as compared to our own group. So, dear learners, we have covered beautiful aspects of group. We have learnt what is a group, how it is formed, what are the different stages of the group, what is a group structure, what are its elements and in the last we have understood what are different kinds of groups. So, hope you have enjoyed the session thoroughly.